Hey folks, Kiltman here. Kiltman at your services. How are you all? I hope you're all doing very, very well. Uh, we're going to talk about vampires again. I know, the channel seems to have been devoted to all things Nosferatic lately. By the way, the Chris Young Kickstarter to get his score for Nosferatu. <laughs> Big success! It made the money, and then some. So, it's going to happen, folks. And there will be a victory video for it from yours truly mm, in a day or so. Got a little idea for that. But anyway, that's great news. And we have a remake of Nosferatu from Robert Eggers coming at the start of 2025. And also in 2025, we're going to get another <sighs> Dracula movie. Yes, I have reported on this already and pulled a little bit of scorn on it. Luc Besson, yes, Wonderkind, French cult director, you know, Leon, the messenger, the fifth element, Dogman, is tackling Dracula. The Prince of Darkness, you know, the Count of Monte Carpathian Mountains. Yes, Dracky Pants himself, Bram Stoker's Dracula. And uh, it's been done to death and beyond. But as I always say, Dracula is so open to different takes and interpretations that it can work. You can have Dracula in space. You can have Dracula underwater. You, you can do whatever you want with Dracula. You can tell different portions of the story. We've had the last voyage of the Demeter. Which seemed like a great idea on paper. Hmm. Until you saw the actual movie itself. Ooh dear. I covered it, so look back on that for my full verdict. Um, but... I don't mind people having a stab at a adaptation of Dracula, a revamping as it were, a reimagining, whatever you do. But if you start saying that you're going back to Bram Stoker's original 1897 novel, which is there, just there, and saying you're being faithful to it, you're taking this from that novel, but that you're taking was never in the novel at all, then I've got a real bad problem with you. You can do whatever you want, but just don't say things like, well, going back to Bram Stoker's original prose, what he wrote, the character of Dracula, we're taking that and we're making my movie out of that. That's what I love about the book, which is basically what Luke Besson has said. I'm gonna read you two quotes from said director, Luke Besson. And, uh, and it makes my, Mostly whiskey fueled veins boil, but I don't mind him as a director, do not get me wrong. And the film that he makes, which is called, well, it's a lamentable title anyway, Dracula, a love tale, a love tale, not even a love story. I think that actually exists. I think that was a stage production. I think, could be wrong. But his new version, which is screenwritten by himself and directed by himself, and starring in the title role, Caleb Landry Jones, who is in Luke Besson's last movie, Dogman. And it's got Christoph Waltz in there as well. But as yet, they haven't said what character he's playing. Caleb Landry Jones is playing Dracula. Christoph Waltz, we don't know. Van Helsing? Somebody else. Who knows? But Dracula, a love tale. And the story is that the old, yes, the old 15th century Prince, Prince Vladimir, yeah, Vlad Tepesh, of course, loses his wife, renounces God, and becomes a vampire. Hmm. Because that, that's how it happens. Renounce God, be, throw fangs, drink blood. That's it. Only come out at night. That's what happens, apparently. It happened for Bram Stoker's Dracula, for Francis Ford Coppola. Francis Ford Coppola's Bram Stoker's Dracula. Dear God, we'll talk about that in a minute. I'm playing uh, Vicek Kilar's enormously addictive score for Bram Stoker's Dracula. The Gary Oldman one, you know it. Winona Ryder, um, Keanu Reeves, John Wick, John Wick attempting an English accent. Bloody wolves chasing me through some blue inferno! <laughs> Dear God. But I still love that movie. But there's a yin and yang to that as well. But, so the story is basically the same as that. Dracula, Prince Vladimir, 
renounces God, becomes a vampire, and wants his wife back. He wants his long lost love to return. Be it a reincarnation, be it meaner, as we get with Bram Stoker's Dracula. So that's the, the concept of it. And it's meant to be epic. People who've read the screenplay have reported that it's got massive set piece battles and some really gruesome elements to it as well. Now we know that Luc Besson can do historical stuff with big sets and big locations and masses of extras. He did The Messenger, you know, which is the Joan of Arc story. And you know, that was, yeah, it was okay. The battle scenes were pretty damn good to be honest. And uh, so he can do this sort of thing. But it's been done before. Luke Evans, another Luke. Luke Evans did um, Dracula, The Untold Story, which really wasn't very good. It was for the universe, Universal Dark Monsters, the Dark Monster Universe, the Monster Bear, whatever they tried to call it, but it fucking flopped big time. And again, Bram Stoker's Dracula attempted the same thing, to tell the, the story of an age-old count, an old dynastic warlord, who saved Transylvania and the outer Romania from invading Turks and then lost his wife, renounces God, becomes a vampire. See how this has been done before? And then gets hunted down and all this sort of stuff by Abraham Van Helsing and the vampire hunters with Winchester rifles and cookery knives. Oh, it's great, it's great. But Luke Besson's version we don't know too much about the entire plotting of it, but I'm going to read you two quotes which have absolutely filled me with utter, utter disdain for this production. Bear in mind, I said before, anyone can attempt to do a Dracula story and do whatever they want with it. My problem is if you say that you're basing it on Bram Stoker's original novel. Quote number one. I was drawn to the love story. I won't do a French accent. I was drawn to the love story. When you read the book, the book which is there, for me, the most interesting part is this man who's gonna wait for centuries because he wants to see his wife again. So for me, it's the ultimate love story. Luke, what book were you reading? You weren't reading Bram Stoker's Dracula. You were reading James V. Hart's script, screenplay for Francis Ford Coppola's Bram Stoker's Dracula, because that's the fucking story from that. Bram Stoker did not write that. He didn't. There's no love story in Bram Stoker's Dracula. There isn't in that book. Look, I've got a hardback edition of Bram Stoker's Dracula, the original Bram Stoker's Dracula, and I can never find it. When I do a video about Dracula, I can never find that bloody book. If the Mansion Spooks nick that, I will go mad. It's a very, it's quite a lovely hardback edition. But anyway, with this, which is from the 1979 John Badham version, that they reprinted the book again in time for that. Now, I'm looking, and, you know, <clears throat> love story, love story, romance, not in there. It's not in that book at all. Oh, maybe, maybe it's a, it, it, it's a bit of romance for Jonathan Harker and his betrothed, Mina. Maybe there's a, even a bit of romance between Lucy Westenra and her suitors, her veritable tribe of suitors, Quincy, Jack Seward, uh, Lord Arthur Holmwood. Yeah, maybe there. Maybe Dracula and his brides. Well, we don't really find out much about that. Jonathan Harker and the brides but there's no in love story between dracula and a long lost wife it's not in the book what are you on about luke besson what are you smoking man you make your film and it could be great it could actually, i could really enjoy it and be sitting here in well 18 months time and a film finally comes out properly that well hang on no it's coming out and if they're filming it now so it's going to come out so well i don't know but next year, I could be sitting here reviewing it and going, do you know what? I loved it, thought it was great. But you see, my problem is, how dare you spout such absolute bollocks and bullshit about, oh, this is my new project. And I'm taking the thing I love most about the book, which is it isn't in the book. Where's this romance? Where's
is this fucking love story that Dracula had for his long lost deceased wife waiting centuries to, what was it again? He's going to wait for centuries because he wants to see his wife again. So for me, ultimate love story. If that's the case, thinking about it now, playing devil's advocate, thinking about it. So your wife dies, you renounce God, become a vampire. You can't die conventionally, you know. It's very hard to kill a vampire. But, so you're going to wait centuries to be reunited with her. Why not just fucking kill yourself while you're human to be reunited with her? It doesn't make any fucking modicum of sense at all. I shall read you a second quote from director Luc Besson about this project. I started shooting it already, Besson said in an interview with the Discourse podcast. It comes from the Bram Stoker tale. That's this one here. But the vision for me is the love story between him and, and his princess, like in the book. <laughs> and so you will see soon. Crucially, now he could have saved himself here. It comes from the Bram Stoker tale, but the vision for me is the love story between him and his princess. Could have stopped there, but he doesn't. Like in the book. And so you will see soon. Like in the book. Folks, do you see my point? You see why I get angry about things like this? I love Dracula. I, I, I don't like, and I've said this on many, many occasions, I don't like the, the, the journalistic notes and letters, diary style of it, um, sort of documentarian style. I don't like that. But forgetting that, the different perspectives and the story itself is still fantastic. And it does come under the, uh, the heading, the, the banner of like a, a gothic romance. But romance does not mean lovey-dovey, cuddle cuddles and smoochy stuff, you know, under the moonlight. It doesn't mean that. A gothic romance in its full-blooded variety is an adventure story. It gets the heart roused and passionate. It doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, there's any activity under the duvet. It's just, you know, passions are aroused, but it's dark, it's foreboding, it's brooding. And it's got that. The book has all of that stuff. But it doesn't have any quest for some long-lost wife some reincarnated bint that, you know, I've pined for you for centuries, you know, and now you're back. I don't know you. I was only born 25 years ago. But you look just like her. I will take you as my bride. And together we shall rule the world from our coffins. <laughs> it's shite, folks. It's come up with stuff like that, you know. It is an abomination. I genuinely think that um, you shouldn't you shouldn't say things like that because it's not true. You're making a movie, fine, great. You're making a track in a movie, fine, great. Do it, do whatever you want with it, but just don't say that it's based on the original novel. James V. Hart's screenplay for Bram Stoker's Dracula from Francis Ford Coppola. It's fucking annoying, isn't it? Um, it, it, it adheres, it brings in more elements from the book, like the suitors, like Quincy P. Morris, like the cookery, like a, a, a lot of the stuff that's in the book, which has usually been jettisoned, is in there. But they added this fucking love story, this centuries old, bygone, you know, besotted nature of this tragic prince, this warlord who renounces God. So it's already been done. So Luke Besson isn't, isn't even creating anything new out of this. At all. And battles and war, it was done with Dracula the Untold Story. So Luke Besson is not creating anything new from what we can see from the threadbare amount of information that we've got. But you know what? Oh, it just, you can see, you can see how these things get me riled. Do whatever you want, just don't try to base it in the text that Bram Stoker wrote. God almighty. I hope it's great though. I, I, I do. I never want a film to fail. I never want a film to be utter shit. And yes, you evolve has made it. But I never want things to, to be, you know, an abysmal failure. I don't go to the flicks to, to throw popcorn and 
well, I'll never throw me whiskey at the screen. I'm never going to do that. I'm not going to do a McCready and be a sore loser, you know, like, and pour it, you know. That scene in the thing, that's the one thing about the thing. I'm like, what, what, really? If you love your, you love your plonk that much, you're not going to pour it into a fucking computer chess machine. And how many times have you sat in this shack and played computer chess and probably lost? So how much, you can't pour it in just once and then you're going to fire the machine up again because it fizzes and it malfunctions and it's, he's killed it. Little tangent there for you folks. He says, clutching, clutching his whiskey. Never going to chuck this away. Never, never, never. Well, I'll chuck it down my neck, but I'm not going to fucking pour it away. No, I don't know what Luke Besson is smoking, but he has not read that book. I think, stupidly, that he's, and I, I, you know, I could be wrong, but he, he's not given me much to work with here, other than, you know, my very staunch opinion that he hasn't read the book, judging by his direct quotations, that he's read and watched, you know, read the screenplay for Bram Stoker's Dracula, and watched the movie, and, and thought that that, oh, that, because it's called Bram Stoker's Dracula, so it must be faithful, so I'll take that element and I'll make my eras and decades, centuries long love story. You know. But it's not from Bram Stoker. He didn't do that. God. Oh my God. Just do whatever you want. But don't say you're taking it from Bram Stoker. He must be fucking doing pirouettes in his grave right now. The desecration that his creation has, has suffered. And let's not forget that Dracula is not a, a romantic character in that book. He's a repellent, repugnant, vilified, horrible, vindictive monster. Yeah, you know, he does transform throughout when he gets to London and all that, and Whitby and gets to Blighty. Yeah, and invades, you know, London, English aristocracy. But he's not a romantic figure. Bela Lugosi brought that in on the stage production. And then, of course, for um, Todd Browning, 1931, Dracula, which changed, you know, the, the visual style and the character quite considerably, made him suave, sophisticated, you know, this, this cultured Euro Eastern European with an exotic flavour about him and the seductive, smouldering eyes. You know, I could fall for him myself in that description. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not what he wrote. That's not it. <laughs> oh, I better calm down. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do myself an injury, and I, I'm going to a, a funeral wake just after doing this video. In fact, uh, my good friend Martin, God rest your soul. Rest in peace, man. Rest in peace. I didn't go to the actual funeral itself. Uh, but I watched it live, uh, you know, they film these things and you can get a pin number and watch it. And it was very moving. But I'm joining everyone for the air uh, of the week. But uh, yeah, it's just, I'm going to read these quotes again just to get myself all over again. Luke, Luke Besson, the guy that did the fifth element. I was drawn to the love story. There isn't one. When you read the book, for me, the most interesting part of it is the man who's going to wait for centuries because he wants to see his wife again. Not in the book. So for me, it's the ultimate love story. Not in the book. Lies, lies, lies. You silly Frenchman. You silly fool. Idiot! Second quote. I started shooting it already. It comes from the Bram Stoker tale. But the vision for me is the love story between him and his princess. Like in the book. <laughs> Not that book. Not that book. And so you will see soon. And so you will see soon. Ah, <sighs> oh, dearie me. Dearie, dearie me. Not good. Uh, I've, said, I've said my piece. I will report more upon this, but you know, and again, you know, sitting on the fence, I don't want to be, you know, slagging anything off. There's plenty of people on YouTube that exist just to do that. 
oh, you know, I can have a rant now and again, but by and large, I promote stuff and look forward to stuff and try to G up enthusiasm. And uh, you know, I, I don't want to be pissing on someone's parade, but I can't help that. I love this character. I grew up with this character, as many of us did, and we've seen many iterations of it. Some fantastic, some disastrous, some were spoof. Leslie Nielsen did it. Um, George Hamilton the fourth did it, and uh, John Holmes did it. <laughs> Paul Morrissey did it as well, you know, with Udo Kier, and uh, you know, there's every type. Dan Curtis did it with Jack Palance, you know. It, Christopher Lee, obviously, Bela Lugosi, it, even um, the Wolfman, what's his buddy name? One of my, Lon Chaney Jr. played the son of Dracula, you know, uh, Count Alucard, Alucard. You take us for a moron? <laughs> we put up a mirror to your name, we're going to see Dracula, but we won't see you in the reflection. <gasps> I love them. I love them. And as I say, this could actually end up being quite a spectacular and really moving, you know, story. But I'm kind of sick of Dracula being portrayed as, you know, a victim. We've done that. We've gone through that, that, that wave, that phase. At least Demeter, last word of the Demeter, did portray him as, you know, just, well, almost, almost wordless. There's a couple of words in there. And he is the bat creature for the entirety of the movie until that fucking ridiculous thrown on, tacked on little anti-climax, which was just god awful and woefully unnecessary. But at least he was a monster throughout the entire movie. But no, now we're going back to, oh, let's explore his character, his soul, the darkness within, the tragedy of him. No, 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 he's not like that. <laughs> You can do that, but just don't say that it's part of that book that Bram Stoker wrote. Because it isn't. It's not in there. Go read the book. Luke, go read the book. And I think you'll be, oh shit, mad. And you'll be doing some rethinking. Certainly, like, you'll be redacting some of these quotes you've given in interviews. I'm going to read it again. I was drawn to the love story. When you read the book for me, like when you read the book for me, so I'm reading it to you. That'll be a fucking big learning curve for you, mate. Uh, mon ami. When you read the book for me, the most interesting part is this man who's going to wait for centuries because he wants to see his wife again, which makes no fucking sense whatsoever. So for me, it's the ultimate love story. None of it's in that book. I started shooting it already. It comes from the Bram Stoker tale. No shit. But the vision for me is the love story between him and his princess. Like in the book. Not this book. And so you will see soon. This is a studio. Cheers, y'all. This music is phenomenal, though. I mean, at the very least, you might get a spectacular take visually on the Dracula as a pure vampiric bastardo. And you might get a great score as well. You might do. Or you might get that tentacle diva from the, the fifth element. <laughs> Doing all this shit like... I mean, the Coppola version, it has horror, it has dark, gothic atmosphere. It's drenched in mood. Some of the characters, well, some of the incarnations of those characters, and I'm thinking of Winona and I'm thinking of Keanu, uh, are not that great. But the rest of them, as an ensemble, do bring a lot to it. Anthony Hopkins as Van Helsing is Loopy Lou, but you know, I like it, it kind of works for me. It's never quite as gory or as horrific as I'd like it to be, but it does, it does so much that I love that I can easily just shunt, shift, shove to one side 
all the naff elements of which there are plenty. But the score is not one of the naff elements. I mean, I've been talking about Chris Young's score for Nosferatu a lot, you may have noticed. Uh, and to see Nosferatu and to hear that score playing alongside it is a, a, a revelation. Now, uh, Vajcek Kilar, his score for this, it, it, it's, it's grandiose, it's operatic, it's big, it's darkly romantic, it's sweetly tragic. But it's full of bombast, stem and drang, and my God, it's so powerful that I listen to this infinitely more times than I watch the movie itself. And it tells its own story. But again, if you watch this movie with this score playing, which has happened, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna round this out now with the, the most energetic score, uh, piece of music that's ever, ever been composed, orchestrated, and then played. And it is Race Against the Sunset. I think I've done this before on the channel, I'm sure I have. You know, on the, the every version of the, uh, the album, the, the soundtrack, you'll get the score, you'll get that track remixed, and usually down mixed as well. But I'm gonna play you uh, a version which is live to the movie and uh, oh dear god I always bang on about like uh, how orchestras and individual players must be so exhausted you know I'm really in the moment the, the people must be having cardiac arrests you know you know the string section alone would be decimated by the activity the sweat be pouring everywhere but we're going to do this this is the, the chase through the Carpathian Mountains back to Castle Dracula to save Mina, to kill Dracula, and fight off all these gypsies. But here you go. This is a live orchestra. And a live audience clapping. Already I'm exhausted. I'm just sitting here. I'll be on the triangle. Or the bongos. I'll be honest, there's not a lot of variation to this track, but it's thunderous, it's galloping, it's ferocious. And it's so shrill. Can you imagine these poor bastards? Forget Andre Rowe, Rue, whatever his name is. But he dances across the stage whilst doing all this with his hair all frizzing up. This is where it's at. This is, this is orchestral warfare. If Luke Besson can conjure up anything as exciting as this, then I will go, well, at least you did that. But you still haven't read Bram Stoker's book, have you? No, me no. They're not stopping. <laughs> You'd be knackered. You'd be rubbing elbow grease on. Aye. Be steam coming off the violins and the cellos. The harp and the double bass. <laughs> Be honest, you're not sitting still right now, are you? No, you're reaching up to turn this video off. <laughs> God, I can't stand any more of it. <laughs> you're still here. You like that? <laughs> Charge! You get his saber out. Richard E. Grant. It's Dr. Seward. Tally ho, chaps! <laughs> and you got Quincy with his Winchester pinging off chippos. And then his cookery. For Quincy. 
gets killed as well. But they, without Quincy, they wouldn't have defeated Dracula. That's in the book. So the baby for uh, Mina and Jonathan, they name him Quincy. It just doesn't stop. How many members of that orchestra died during this performance? That's a fucking locomotive coming through. Yeah. Great big crucifix on the front. <laughs> Luke Besson, if you can conjure this excitement and make your audience like this, then no matter what fucking airs and graces and fallacies you create, then I'm with you. Trance, couldn't you? <laughs> look at that! <laughs> fucking eyeballs, fucking wrecked. Eardrums shattered. Your eyeballs driven around the back of your head by the furious, you know, tsunami off the strings. <laughs> <sighs> Thank God for that. Right, folks, I have been over Shabby Kiltman, please. In the meantime, in this ever, whoa, musically, vampirically exhausting in between time, please keep it kilted, keep it Celtic. And, you know, don't take these filmmakers at their word. They're full of fucking hyperbole and bullshit. That's what they do. But you'd think you'd have someone to go, like, uh, uh, Luke, before you get that published or you put that quote out there can I just <gasps> man uh... the thing I love about Bram Stoker's I can't do the accent Bram Stoker's Dracula is uh, what I imagined to be uh, his backstory not what not what Bram wrote himself but what I imagined and I'm making the film from what I imagined Bram Stoker meant. So you get around it that way. Very fucking tenuously, but... Hmm. Right, I've got to go. Be happy, be safe. Whatever happens, happens. Life exists in us, around us, and under us and over us. And I've got no idea where I'm gonna go with that little metaphor. But anyway, the point is, live life to the full. Every day that you've got of it, make sure it counts. I don't mean counts as in Count Dracula, but make sure that I love to count. You know, I don't mean that. I'm gonna go to this wake now. I've seen the service and it was it was moving. The speeches were the eulogies were brilliant. I I know I've done several, uh, and I envisage doing several more as well. I've I've got my own one planned, and I intend to deliver it because no one else could deliver my eulogy other than me. <laughs> but I'm going to meet them all now, and uh, and it's a celebration of life. We've all said this, you know, before the funeral took place. Things could be different now, but. The, Bit of that goes down. People could be a bit like that, but in, in my experience, wakes are actually really, really enjoyable, especially old traditional Scottish wakes. Have I told you about the 24-hour wake I got? I got trapped in in Moffat. Oh dear, dear lord, it was great. I did not. I did not know the deceased. I didn't know anybody there. I had just wandered in for a wee bevy. And they shut the doors after like everyone turned up and I've been warned repeatedly by different bars that the change of shift 
and different bar staff came in and they went, you, you know there's a leak taking place? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm fine with that. Yeah, it's all right. Don't worry about it, yeah. I, thought, I, won't, I won't get involved. Ha <laughs> ha! I won't get involved. Lock the fucking doors. I couldn't get out. I was there for 24 hours. No sleep. Enormous amounts of beer and whiskey. Completely blitzed. Drank yourself sober. Danced with everybody. It was wonderful. Found myself on the floor in various places alongside other people. Woke up. Drank more. Danced more. It was amazing. Absolutely amazing. And there was no signal on your phone either. So Mrs. Kiltman and the family and the friends we were staying with in Moffat who owned a farm there were wondering where the hell has Kiltman gone? <laughs> oh dear. But the local police weren't too bothered. Oh, he's, he's gone missing, has he? When's the last time you fucking saw him? Well, he was walking round from our friend's farm to the town of Moffat. Oi, there's a fucking big week going on there. That's where he'll be. Don't you worry about that, Lovey. He'll be fine. His liver won't be, though. <laughs> right, tangent over. I'm out of here. Take it easy.